Welcome to our October 16th worship service from North Coast United Methodist Church. Lift your weary limbs and let the Spirit blow through your lives. This is our spiritual worship, a gift of renewal and grace. Thank you for joining us today in worship, and may the Holy Spirit fill your soul in this time together. Let's join together in our call to worship. Are you growing as the body of Christ? We are rooted and built in Christ alone. Do you believe in the power of God? We trust in the fullness of God's grace. Will you open your heart to God and one another? We will embrace the words of love within us. Let us worship the one whose breath gives us life. Amen.
week, we continue talking about the prophet Elijah. Last week, Elijah got out of town after telling everyone that it wasn't going to rain for a while. It made him a little bit unpopular. When the stream that Elijah had been living by dried up, he needed to find a new place to live. Pretty stat, right? The town was out of water. Elijah's out of water. Now what's he going to do? He had to listen to God. This time, God told him to get up, go down the road a little bit more, and find someone else. Well, he found a poor widow. Now, widows didn't do so well for themselves back in the day. Once your husband died, it wasn't pretty good for you, right? So, a very poor widow and her son were preparing to make their final meal before they ran out of food. That was a pretty bad situation for them, right? Well, along comes Elijah, and he says, God told me to come and talk to you and to ask you for food. What? This poor widow. <laughs> Here she is, last of her food. Along comes Elijah asks and is asking her for food. What would you do? Well, she goes, well, okay, I, I guess, you know, come on in. But God was about to do something amazing for this widow and Elijah. So, she just said, okay, come on in. So she made food for Elijah and God gave her more flour and more oil. And they just kept being able to make more and more food. God was granting them a blessing, more food, more oil, more flour again and again and again. And it was blessing them with food all the time, constantly. And it just kept run, kept coming again and again, and it didn't run out. God was taking care of them in an amazing way. Unfortunately, later on, the son died. Elijah was so angry and so upset with God. He came out and he said, God, why? Why did you help us so often, but yet you still allowed this son to die? What happened? Why? Elijah called out to God and God chose to show his mighty power to the widow and to Elijah. Have you ever wondered why God lets terrible things happen? One reason is because he allows us to make our own choices. We're not robots. We are given those choices to show that there are consequences to all of our actions, good ones and bad ones. But here's another reason. Sometimes he allows bad things to happen so that he can show us his incredible power. When we see God's power, we know that he's there. Our faith grows. We learn more about God and that we can trust him. together in prayer. Everlasting God, you chart the course of our lives. You watch over us to pluck up and break down our errant ways, to build up and plant new possibilities for life in your spirit. Be our God, and we will be your people, a people who know you and keep your ways. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. No. Oh. 
I would apologize if I could see it in your eyes. Cause when you showed me myself, I became someone else. But I was caught in between all you wish for and all you need. I picture you fast asleep. Will I find? Will I find? Will I find my own way? What way will I find you? Find you? I don't know anymore what it's for. I'm not even sure. In the sun, will you help me understand? Cause I've been caught in between all I wish for and all I need. Maybe you're not even sure what it's for. join together in our words of assurance everything we need to see the word of god live the word of god and share the word of god lies within our hearts do not be afraid of the wounds that open us to the glory of god's loving growth let all be well in your souls our Amen. scripture reading today comes from Colossians within the second chapter. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Strengthen in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a moon celebration, or a Sabbath. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Precious and loving God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for all that Jesus Christ has done from us, for us, from living with us and showing us an active way to be your image, to the greatest sacrifice, which is the death, burial, and resurrection that has brought salvation for us all. Be with us today, God, as we enjoy your nature and your environment and as we celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us and what we can't lose. Be with us in this conversation, Lord, and we thank you for the actions of your Son. Amen. This scripture is beautiful. 
The scripture gives us a reminder of what grace truly is. And I want to look at this today on a very personal level. I want to share it with all of you. Because for me, and I've shared this in different ways, through different videos, for me, I have a beginning point. I believe as a pastor, as, as I've studied the Wesleyan understandings of grace, I do truly believe in provenient grace. I believe that God existed with me in different ways and prepared me for a moment as a 14-year-old walking down the aisle of Cornerstone Baptist Church, going to the Reverend Dr. Ken Martin and receiving Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe in provenient grace. I believe that God was present in my life to that point. But for me, <clears throat> also, I have a very special acknowledgement within myself from having that professed beginning point. I have a place that I have that I said that this is mine and I want to live with it and I want to interact with it and I want to grow with it. This is me joining in to the game and taking the field. Good morning. How are you? That beginning point is very special to me. So today I'm going to share a lot about that. As we talk about what Jesus Christ has done for us, as we look at this scripture, again, using the analogy of a rooted tree. Last Sunday, during our in-person worship service, I took all the kids outside, and we stood at this tree that existed on our property before our church was ever there. It was once upon a time this acorn that hit the ground on this empty lot somewhere in parts unknown Oceanside, now known as 1501 Kelly Street. And there in this empty field, a seed got buried, it got watered, it kept being fed, it grew, and then we have this big giant tree and in front of our church that's this image that there's something that existed there before us, there's something that will exist there after us, and there is something that is currently existing there with us in the present. And that is the beauty of what I want to share with you about Christ. Now, the beginning of this scripture today talks about everything that Jesus Christ has already done. It talks about the actions. It talks about the one who has truly taken care of everything for us. The one that did the actions that could solve the unanswerable question of what's next. That's what I walked down the aisle to discover. I had a great worry and a great concern in my life because of the wonderment of what's next. Is this it? Is this all? Well, one day will I close my eyes and there'll be nothing anymore? Will the machine just turn off? That was the questions that existed in my life pre-14-year-old Drew Davis at Cornerstone Baptist Church. I wanted an assurance that there was something else. So, now I exist within that. And today I want to celebrate with you the, the actions that were taken, but they're, <clears throat> they're really, hi, good morning. They're really actions that will never go away. I'm going to give you the definition of grace. And the definition of grace as described by Drew Davis. My definition of grace is this. There is a place that we stop. There's a place that we have the ability to get to on our own, and we can't get past that spot. There's things that we do, we say, we are incomplete beings. As John Wesley once shared, we are people who are constantly moving towards perfection, but because of our imperfection, we can't fully get there. So there's a place where I stop, but Jesus Christ takes over. And there's a blessing in that and it exists in this scripture today. So as we look at this, I want to give you all 
some assurance. Hi, good morning. I want to give you all some assurance that when Jesus Christ picks us us picks us up and takes us to where God wants us to be, we can't lose that. That's grace is not taken away from us. And that's a hard topic to battle to and we'll we might delve into that on Tuesday a little bit. But for you today, I want to give you the assurance that grace does not go away. Now this gets back to my point of why it's so crucial and important to me that I, although fully believing and celebrating the provenient grace of Jesus Christ, that through provenient grace that God was with me through this long journey that got me to the aisle of Cornerstone Baptist Church. But there's a beautiful starting point and it becomes this idea of justifying grace that I want to celebrate as we look at the scripture that the first half of it talks about everything that Jesus Christ has done for us to give us safety and security in our being. Safety and security in who we are. Safety and security that we're never truly alone. We're never forgotten. And, hi, good morning. There's always somebody around to take care of us. I try in my life to stray away from platitudes. Now, what a platitude is, is these statements that we make so that we can make someone else feel better. But it's nothing more really than a band-aid. Statements like, God will never give you more than you can handle, or, you know, the greatest platitude that's hurt so many dear souls is, if you just had a little bit more faith, you'd pull through this. It's They're not actually statements that help other people, but they're band-aids that we throw on so that the person sharing them can feel better and walk away from the conversation. So the next statement I'm about to make is a platitude, but then I'm going to explain the reality of it. There's a platitude that I hear, and most of the time it makes me cringe. It's Jesus Christ has already taken care of it so you can get through it. There's a beautiful reality in that. It's a beautiful reality that we had a Savior who came and lived with us. I share this so many times. I believe in the God that could have snapped his fingers and eradicated sin. I believe in that God. I celebrate the God who put on flesh and walked with us and lived with us and moved with us, who cried with us, who worried with us, who led the troops into Palm Sunday and as Philippians 2.8 shares, humbling himself in the complete being a man that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. I celebrate that Jesus. So when I hear this platitude that Christ has already beat it so you can get through it, that's the reality of that for me, that Jesus Christ went through all these actions and paid for all of our sins. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And thankfully his existence helped us be washed away from sin. But then the platitude of that is, okay, that's great, but I'm still living through this and I'm walking through the pits of hell. So I can remember it was Christ was there, but show me how Christ was there. Now that, that's, that's where the platitude frustrates me, but it's actually where I'm going to go with this conversation now. There's an act of nature that's a necessity in realizing when we look at the actions of Jesus Christ that's displayed in this. 
those actions of Jesus Christ actually become very pertinent within the understanding of the second level of grace, which is justifying grace. Justifying grace is the time that we spend responding to what Jesus Christ has already done. It's the time that we spend in response to Christ's care, in response to Christ's loving actions, in response to the one that has done the things that we can't do on our own. So, when I look at this platitude once again through the eyes of the reality of grace, it's not, hey, just let go of my God, the band-aid platitude. It's, it's definitely not bad. But what it is, it is the opportunity for us to realize, hey, we're loved, we're cared for, there's somebody that's already done the actions, and we can become reliant on that to do what we need to do to follow it through. It's the response. There is a, what are you going to do about it? And that, <laughs> as I use that phrase, I'll give you another definition that I used to use for grace. Just because how I accidentally just phrased that. And that phrase is, grace is this reality that God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. But then we get this to this level of justifying grace where we say, God loves us, so what are we going to do about it? it? It boils back to the response. But through justifying grace, we continue to have this image of an individual who is doing for us, who's caring for us, and is there waiting for us to respond to them. So that's that whole first half of the scripture. Scripture is, hey, Jesus Christ has got this, buddy. Jesus Christ took care of it, so you can get through it. There's the platitude for the last time. There's another reality that exists in this conversation that I truly want to point out, and it's this. And it comes out of the second half of the scripture. <clears throat> if grace is something we can't lose, and if we realize that grace is something that we can't lose, why are we miserable? Why do we let the little things bother us from time to time? Why do we allow things to, to come along and knock us off of our knock us off of our chairs? Why do we let things bother us? Why do we let things knock us off of the pedestal of grace? And it's, it's this whole level of insecurity. And this whole second part of the scripture today is dealing with insecurity. It's dealing with the moments that we ourselves can't see the one that's promised to go away. We can't feel the grace that we can't lose. And then when, we, when we're in those moments of fear and worry and frustration, it's real easy to feel abandoned and forgotten and just so out of place and out of sorts, we ask the question, where is God? Well, God is standing right in front of us. We don't always see that God is right in front of us. There's times that I've used this explanation as sort of the return of prevenient grace, even after we've had our connection with justifying grace. It's that moment that we ask, where is God? We can't see God. We can't feel God. We're in this emotional place that even to an extent we can't understand God. But prevenient grace returns and God's still there, even though we're not aware of Him. So this whole last part of this scripture becomes this conversation of don't judge yourself against the festivals. Don't judge yourselves against man-made principles. Don't judge yourselves against things 
that exist outside of you because the one that exists outside of you has already taken it. Now, I've known so many people, and including the person that's speaking right now, I've known so many people that have built fragile house of cards. Good morning. Hi. That have built fragile house of cards based on this is how I found my connection to the Christ. And this is how that I vibrantly live. This is how I see the fruits of God growing through me that it's got to be the same for everybody else. We're going to talk about that more on Tuesday, but I'm going to hold this against me for now. And sometimes we see other people prospering in ways that we don't understand. And we begin to question our place in faith. And it's what the last half of the scripture is about. After we've found Christ, after we've rooted ourselves in the soils of hope, as we found our place in the kingdom of salvation, we can't let the outside stressors steal from us the reality that God is reaching back for us. That God is constantly reaching back for us, longing for us to respond, longing for us to celebrate our place in this unending kingdom of care and grace. Longing for us to reach out, reach back and proclaim, I know you're there and I want to walk with you. So we get into this last part of the scripture. We celebrate the one that did all the work, but then we're reminded that all these other things don't eradicate that work. All these other things don't eradicate that care. All these other things can't erase what have already been done because it's been done by the one that has just taken care of it all. When you kind of feel lost and concerned and worried with things, there's there's something I would like for you to remember. There is something I want you to, to hold on to, and it's the reality of what grace really is. If, if grace is the thing that picks us up where we stop and carries us all the way to where God is, or God wants us to be. Do we not think that the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, understands what causes us to stop? If we are people who are constantly moving on towards perfection, but we have to deal with our imperfections in that process, do we not think that God already knows and understands this thing that we feel that's holding us back? If we can just slip into that reality, slip into that understanding, wow, I made this mistake. God knows it. God knew it. But God still created grace to pick us up, to carry us where God wants to be. There is always a place of forgiveness in the kingdom of the actions of Jesus Christ. If you were remember anything from this other than my panting and heavy breathing that's what I want you to remember is Christ took care of everything even the mistake that we think that God will never forgive us for Jesus Christ took care of everything even the mistake that we hold fear and shame of other people discovering Jesus Christ has taken care of everything, even in the deepest moments of despair that we have cursed God's name because we don't like how things are going. Jesus Christ took care of all of that. And what this last bit of scripture is sharing, whatever principles that we create that separate us from who God is, Jesus Christ stepped through those things took care of those things. And on Ascension Day, I commonly use this narrative 
on Ascension Day, when Christ rises up to heaven, Jesus Christ collects all those things and rises up to heaven and sets them at the feet of God to take care of them. I'll close with this statement. That's why I like an altar prayer. That's why I grew up loving that altar prayer going to church as a kid. And I was at that altar every week, every day, praying at that altar, setting things at the feet of Jesus Christ, setting my baggage, my worry, my concern, setting everything at the feet of Jesus Christ because this ascension narrative that I'm sharing with you becomes this image of the one that takes the things that I set at his feet and he takes them to his daddy and sets them at his. So that's today. That's our conversation for Sunday. I want you to remember that no matter the mistake or the worry or the concern or the questioning or the bewilderment, there's nothing that can take away from you what Jesus Christ has done for you. Sit in that grace and celebrate it. In your son's precious name, we say thank you. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My name is the Reverend Michael Drew Davis. God is love. Amen. I'd like to have the opportunity to get to know you. Please email us at ncumcinfo at gmail.com. And if you've been enjoying our services online, please email us. Please say hello. Again, that's ncumcinfo at gmail.com. And also, if you'd like to give to our church, please go to northcoastumc.org and click on the Give button. Again, that's northcoastumc.org and click on the Give button. Thank you for joining us. Let's join together in our prayer of giving. Engrave these gifts with your love, O God. Send them forth into the world that they may reveal your glory. Work through this offering that others might grow strong through the gift of your grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Again, for joining us in worship, let's join together in our closing benediction. Let us live our lives in Christ Jesus, the root and foundation of our lives. Grow up in the faith God has given us, the faith that makes us whole. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. God is love. Amen.